Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to church. Uh, we we for, for for those of you who are here back here for the first time, a couple of things I want to make sure you're aware of. Some of them you've already discovered, like you have to go to your seat to find your bulletin. Um, we this week we moved this uh, tripod up because I heard there were audio issues with it further back. Um, I've asked somebody to move it back after the sermon because at that point the audio issues are less important uh, for the people at home because you know they can't join us in communion without being here. That's what comes after the sermon. So, um, the other thing I want to make sure you're aware of: we will come up to the rail to receive communion. Uh, we will. Commune by tables. Those tables should consist of uh, people who you're uh, at home with, people who you'd be in contact with anyway. So that's generally going to be just your family, um, or or if you're you know you're the only person in your pew, or you're you know there's three people in your pew, you can meet six feet between. That's fine. Don't kneel at the rail as well. Um. All that said, let's worship the Lord with our opening hymn number 494. Well, if I get my hand washing station, that that <laughs>
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord.
Let us pray. Almighty God, your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, ascended into the heavens. So may we also ascend in heart and mind and continually dwell there with him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Witnesses 
in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
here that we're observing it late because the timing of this thing is actually important. The ascension of our Lord took place 40 days after his resurrection. I had seen earlier, before everything went a little crazy, to actually have a Thursday night ascension service this year. And then I decided that things were a little too crazy to try to start something new like that. But it's important to recognize this because this is one of the four days on the church calendar that are the most important days in all of history, that are the most important days in Christ's life, that are the most important days theologically on the whole calendar. I'll go through them in order. First, we have Christmas where Christ became a man in order that he could share our lowly state, in order that he could bear our sins and be our Savior. Christmas is all about Good Friday. That's its purpose. Christmas is God becoming a man in order that God could die for us. So the next day, then, obviously, is Good Friday. Good Friday is where Jesus won the victory. Good Friday is where the forgiveness of your sins was accomplished. The trouble with Good Friday is that on the first Good Friday, nobody but Jesus knew how good it was. <clears throat> Jesus had told them. He told them that this had to happen in order that he could win their forgiveness, in order that he could win their salvation. But none of them believed him. Until the second most important and the third in line of these great days. And that is the day of Easter. Easter is important because it shows God's verdict on Christ's death. That death could not hold Christ is the testimony that what he said is true. That the victory actually was won. That your sins actually are paid for. Easter matters because Christ had promised that the grave would not hold him, and he promises that just as it cannot hold him, so it will not be able to hold his Christians. Easter is the proof that Jesus was who he said he was and that he achieved what he set out to achieve. All things have worked and will work according to his divine design. And that brings us to today. Ascension Day. Why does ascension matter? It matters because Christ ascended on high, leading captivity captive. It matters because God in Christ has redeemed you. Because Christ ascended on high, according to Ephesians chapter 4, in order that he might fill all things. I don't want to get too into the weeds on a theological controversy, but it's actually sort of important. The argument goes, according to some, that Christ, because he has a human body, can only be present in one place at one time. Because that's the nature of a human body. Your body is limited to where it is right now. 
You cannot be here and there. You have to pick one. And so, because of that, these people argue, Christ cannot be present on our altar, in the body and blood, and also present in some other altar, on some other altar, in some other church, even three miles away, much less a hundred miles away. It's just not possible. And this brings us back to the argument of Ephesians. That Christ ascended in order to fill all things. And there's something here we see in a bunch in the Bible. And we don't pay enough attention to it. We tend to just glaze over it. But you see, a whole bunch of times in the Bible, Jesus says, or the, the Bible says, that Jesus did something in order that he might be glorified. Or in order that he might be exalted far above all things. And you stop, and you think about it, and you say, wait. Jesus is and always was God, right? John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Right? So Jesus was always God. Isn't God already exalted above all things? Isn't God already glorious above all things? Doesn't God already fill all things? Couldn't we have said before Jesus became a man that he was here and there and everywhere? That he filled all things? And the answer is, of course we could. So what's really going on here? What are these passages actually talking about? The answer, dear Christian is that Jesus is not exalted according to his divinity. His divinity was always exalted. I'll put it this way. The amazing thing about the ascension is not that the Son of God ascended into heaven. We expect that. That's the obvious conclusion. And the fact that we generally tend to read the Ascension story that way is part of why we think of it as just the end of the story instead of the completion of the story. What's going on here is not that God's Son ascends to the right hand of the Father, but that Mary's Son ascends to the right hand of the Father. Now, yes, they are the same person. This is Jesus Christ. He is both fully God and fully man. But in the ascension, God brings humanity to himself. God gives humanity the right to be children of God. Not because he crafted them out of soil and clay and breathed into them, but because he bought them with his blood, because he became one of them, because he has adopted humanity into himself. From the time he was conceived, Jesus laid aside his divine gifts and attributes. He always had them. He was always fully God. But he did not always exercise his divine prerogative. So he was able to suffer. He was able to die. He was able to be surprised. To be humiliated.
But in the ascension, he brings these things home. He completes all his work. What began at Christmas is now brought to its ultimate fulfillment. God came to man in order to bring man to God. And on the surface, it looks like he just brought one man to God, namely Jesus Christ. But as our hymn puts it, on Christ's ascension, I now build the hope of my ascension. For where the head is there as well, I know his members are to dwell. When Christ shall come and call. Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the Father, not to leave us behind, not to go back and forget about us, but in order that he might prepare a place for us. And because of this, nothing in the world can frighten or alarm us. Our sins, they've been paid for. I love the angel's words to the disciples at the end of our gospel lesson. Or not the gospel lesson, the epistle lesson. The disciples see Jesus ascend into heaven. And then they just sort of stand there gawking. They just stand there and look up like they're waiting for him to come back. And the angel comes and says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. You're not going to miss it. And in the meantime, in the meantime, Christ still comes to us. Christ is still with us. He is still with us not only in the sense that God is everywhere, but in the sense that he sends us his body and blood to eat and to drink for the forgiveness of all of our sins. And he makes us partakers of his nature, of his perfection, of his sinlessness. So there's nothing to worry about. We know where we are bound. We know that God works out all things for good. We know that heaven's gates have been opened to us.
Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, worthy to be held in reverence by all people everywhere, we give you humble and sincere thanks for the innumerable blessings that you have bestowed on us without any merit or worthiness on our part. We praise you especially for preserving for us your saving word and the holy sacraments. Grant and preserve to your holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine. And provide faithful pastors to preach your word with power. Help all who hear the word rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send laborers into your harvest and open the door of faith to those who do not know you. In mercy, bring to repentance the enemies of your church and grant them amendment of life. Protect and defend your church in all tribulation and danger. Strengthen us and all fellow Christians to set our hope fully on the grace revealed in Christ. And help us to fight the good fight of faith that in the end we may receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow your grace on all nations of the earth. Bless especially our country, its inhabitants, and all who are in authority. Let your glory dwell in our land, that mercy and truth, righteousness and peace may abound in all places. We commend to you the care of our schools, so that our children may grow in useful knowledge and Christian virtue, and thus bring forth wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamity by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine, and from every other evil. Protect and prosper all who labor in their rightful callings, and let all useful arts flourish among us. Be the God and Father of the lonely and the forsaken, the helper of the sick and needy, the comforter of the distressed and those who sorrow. Accept, we implore you, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before you as our humble service. Grant your Holy Spirit to those who come to the Lord's table this day, that they may receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ in sincere repentance and firm faith to their abundant blessing. As we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work you have given us to do while it is day, before the night comes when no one can work. And when our last hour comes, support us by your power, and receive us into your heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly neat, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who after his resurrection appeared openly to all his disciples, and in their sight was taken up into heaven, that he might make us partakers of his divine life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
now may the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in faith and life life everlasting. Now may the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in faith unto life everlasting. Amen. 
are in peace.